The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Well, I'm really happy to be sitting down with Brad Rogers from Wealth Shore today. Brad runs a great business out of Warrnambool in Victoria. And in fact, um, is already on his way to dominating the southwest of Victoria with quality advice, with a real sort of friendly and cultural basis. So um, without any further ado, Brad, welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. Thanks, Ralph C. I really appreciate you having me on today. Well, and, and look, um, you're a really happy guy. I remember meeting you a couple of years ago and you've just came across... As, a, as an everyday kind of person, in fact, two seconds ago, is it Bradley or is it Brad? And he goes, nah, mate, it's Brad. So I've, uh, you, that kind of jocularity is the outward facing Brad Rogers. But I know that you've got a steely disposition and you've got a real business focus. And with that in mind, I'd, I'd love to get to know you and our listeners would love to get to know you. So what, what has brought you to running a financial services business called Wealthshore today? Where'd you come from? So I've, I've probably, Maybe had one of the more traditional type routes of my genre. Um, I went into the Commonwealth Bank graduate program of all places, so don't hold that against me. Mate, it's but... pretty cold today. The cardigan comes in handy. <laughs> so uh, I went through the graduate program, um, and then from there I spent a little bit of time in Canberra. I shipped through – I saw the writing on the wall with Commonwealth Bank probably – and then I jumped and went to the St. George Bank model, which was effectively the self, what I would call the self-employed model with still within a bank. And what year, what years was that? Uh, we're talking, we're talking 2007, 2008 was when I jumped ship from the Commonwealth Bank. And then obviously the Westpac St. George merger happened and I lasted about a week. So from there, I, that's basically when my my business or s- the establishment of my business started. I joined up with an accounting firm in Warrnambool uh, to re-establish my networks. And then from there, I literally joined the F- Financial Wisdom Licence. Uh, that was, so that was 2010 and basically was running my own business as a one-person advisor and growing from there and then the the next stages of what happened there were we moved to RI advice because we'd grown as a conglomerate of advisors sharing costs and then we moved to RI advice the the head advisor uh, at that time was Stephen Hickman who um, basically needed to get was retiring so I took over his client base and the journey the journey from there was 2016 to now and I've been on a growth trajectory. So and, and, and just taking a rewind, yep. what made you pick finance so so you went to Commonwealth Bank what, what fresh out of, of school or university or fresh out of university? Okay. I was actually I, no apologies, a university to a 
Aviva, so Norwich Union. I spent 12 months in their finance team where I started the Diploma of Financial Planning and that gave me the into the graduate program. Why? So I was just, Why financial planning? Part of it was potentially dad. Dad was a financial planner in the Westpac Bank way back when they were selling three funds. They had the property fund, the Australian share fund and a bond fund. So dad was actually, if as a short story, dad was the best Westpac salesman in 1987. He got a little badge and everything. He still talks about that. <laughs> but um, that's that That was probably a little bit because we were always, dad always instilled share market and everything like that. And when I got to university, I just didn't like accounting. I was a specialist. I was in a specialist degree, accounting and finance, and I just didn't like the accounting side. Let's be honest, I wasn't cut out for that. But I did like the the finance and the law side of my degree, and financial planning is a really good fit to the the finance and law. You get to use all your technical knowledge, and then you get to talk to people, and it's different every day. So that's what drew me to financial planning. And is it? It sort of sounds like um, your dad being a legend in 1987. Um, um, <laughs> is that before September 1987 or after? But we'll come to that. Um, <laughs> and you only last in one week in Westpac because they're all like, oh, <laughs> you know, your dad won the award. He tells about it all the time. Um, but clearly, you you had that that lineage in in your family. It's good to know what you don't like and and accounting. And I I also um. Uh, I did accounting at university and I make a terrible accountant, um, which my CFO and my accountant will readily admit in long form. Um, but uh, in relation to the motivation um, of the bit of financial advice, so you've moved into that practice, that accounting practice. You were there by your lonesome for a period of time. And how did you, how did you sort of convince the accountants to trust their clients with you when you wouldn't have been that old when you kicked off. Nah, thankfully there was another financial planner, an older financial planner at that time that was looking to transition out. So that he had he'd done all the hard work with the accountants. So and look I love accountants. I just couldn't be one myself. Look, they've got their they're very important. And we I believe accountants and financial planners should work together. So that's the biggest challenge, I think, is convincing accountants that they should be working with financial planners. But I do a lot of work around that. So that's that. And look, they were more than comfortable with my technical skills. I think that surprised them a little bit that they had this view that financial planners didn't have knowledge or wasn't weren't capable. So I, I think that was the biggest at my age when I was there. That was how I that gave me cut through. So I was able to, they were able to trust me with my knowledge. So that's how how we developed a working relationship. I think you're right. I think um, the, the way to an accountant's heart is through your brain. And, uh, you know, historically, the stereotype of financial planners was, was more sort of sales front and less about technical. And I think that, that um, in, impressing upon them that you actually know um, a little bit about what they're doing um, does go a long way. And so you've now you've now managed to get your own business. You were licensed through FinWiz, which is the which is that that's for the old people who are listening. Um, and and you've moved into RI as as you said, you got into more of a conglomerate there. Was that did you merge a few businesses together, or was it always you you leading from the front and bringing people along? So prior to 2016, it was effectively that conglomerate. There was a few advisors in most. All of them dropped off effectively. They were older advisors and they were just joining up to, which a lot of people would probably know about who were in the financial advice to get volume bonuses. It was all about the volume bonuses and back then that's why they all joined together. Um, they all dropped off as they retired and every, effectively their, their books worked into mine. At that point in time, I then went and had to effectively recruit advisors to my business. So I've been on a steady growth profile since since then. I was I was very, very lucky that Emma Arthur, the first advisor that came across, said yes. So she's an amazing advisor in her own right. Um and it was I went to school with her, so I've known her for a long time and it was just so happened that she needed a bit more flexibility that and the other business she was at 
what I'm looking for a more of a structured commitment to full time. And I said, well, I need an advisor. Do you want to come over? And she said yes. So that was I was very, very lucky in that sense. And look, a shout out to Emma, who clearly knows where the skeletons are buried in your, your, your back history, knowing you from high school. Um, and I note that she's also um, gone on to uh, do a bit of aged care speciality as well as that. That would might talk about a bit more about your practice in a, in a second, but um, given the the location that you are, which is quite a popular uh, um, sort of area for, for business, but also retirees, etc., I'm sure that that is a, a very useful feather in your cap. Yeah, no, she Emma is a specialist in aged care, and we will talk about that more. But so from there, Emma and I grew our team and got got our admin back office, and we we played around with that because we relied a lot initially on good people as opposed to good process. So I was a learning I was on a learning curve and a steep one. But the as we moved through the journey, I, I became a lot better at learning to give up. I couldn't control everything. So because I couldn't control everything, I got good people in my business that I trusted. And from there, we were able to build out really good process and everything along those lines. That that then led to my contract paraplanner becoming an employee. And that was that's shout out to Susie, who is an amazing, amazing paraplanner in her own right. And she's also keeps everyone in this office under control. When, when did was there a moment in time where you got that self awareness? Um, was it was or was it was it born out of out of a, a business trauma or was it just you woke up one day and the sun was rising uh, over the ocean or what what was it, Brad? So so it was a combination of probably two things. That we, it was a business trauma because effectively I was a one advisor practice with a with this massive advisor book and I've gone I was just doing the work. I was just putting in hours because that's what I was always taught to do. You just work and get through it. And and it was just one of those trigger moments that I've gone, this is not going to be sustainable. And so, therefore, I engaged a business coach. So, shout out to Phil Volk who put me through what was Advice 3.0 when he was rolling that program out. And that, that led to you've got to get structure, you've got to get process, and you've actually got to let go. You can't do everything. So that they were the two things that led me to be delegation becoming my friend. And and what's what's um was it was it Paul Volk, did you say? A Phil Volk. Phil Volk. Phil Volk. And do, does Phil have a business name? Phil does have a business name. He has two business names because he's also got a financial planning practice. Oh, very um, good. But We'll, we'll figure it out and send put that there. So um, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll give him a quick shout out. But um, so I've got I wanted to change gears a bit, okay? And um, and so you've had that cathartic moment, and that a one man band is not necessarily an engine room. And then given that this is an engine room podcast, I'm really interested from that moment onwards. Let's call this, you know, uh, it's it's from from the the birth of your self awareness that you can't be the front middle and back office and have a sustainable business, a happy life, and actually look those large number of clients in the eye and tell them that you can do anything other than being reactionary, which was the stereotype of the past. So with that in mind, um, maybe give me a feel now of um, just an idea of your organizational structure. How many ARs do you have in your business, um, Brad? I've got five ARs. I've just brought through a PY advisor who came out of my who was my office manager. Fabulous, and brilliant. So that that's my. I've got five ARs and uh, and and obviously yeah. So and and what kind of what kind of clientele does the practice um have? We mainly have your. We're in the we're in the country, so we're obviously on the coast here, and we've got. A wide variety of advisors. Um, I mean, wide variety of clients. So therefore, we have your typical mum and dads, and then obviously, but we've also got your small business clients and your the farmers that are selling up their dairy farms, uh, which we and the specialist high wealth clients. We've also got a niche little market because mainly off the back of having Emma in our business, but we've got nearly every aged care client in the district 
walks through our door. So if you're passionate about aged care, we, we every aged care client nearly comes through our door. We can hand on heart say that we've got that niche covered. We do do insurance. Obviously, we I've I've come from an insurance background, so I'm I like to think of the technical side of the insurance rather than the sales process. So I'm really big on the advice and the right cover and making sure clients understand, as opposed to just selling selling some insurance policies. But that's we've got a broad range of policies per se and clients on the book, and we. We cover off on the uh, your mid to high wealth type clients that want want advice. And and given um you've got five ARs and you've got um a, a, a back office, and you've a great power plant who you gave a shout out to before. Um, how do you arrange uh, the service lines? Um, uh, are they in pods led by sort of the typical lead advisor or? Or do you share the clients along the journey, particularly because you've got some aged care? Or what, what, how do you how do you arrange the delivery of of services to clients? So we're really big on making sure the right advisor is in in front of the right client. So that's always been our mantra: is to make sure the client gets the right advice. Which and how we do that is we'll we'll regularly do joint appointments with two ARs. We'll all. We'll have an AR walk out of a meeting and go. You'll need to do the rest of that because that's aged care, or that's 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 sitting in your speciality, or they're going to fit better to your personality. So I do that regularly because I'm my client base is probably at capacity, so I'm regularly handing over clients to the other advisors in the in the office. And I, I think that also, you know. This being the Engine Room podcast, you're, you're, you're yet again one of those advisors in transition from being the lead advisor to to spending a lot more time on the business. Um, would that be a fair comment, Brad? Very much, very much so. Without the Engine Room, and probably that's the big piece of my business structure now that's got to allowing us to do what we need to do, Roxy, everything falls down. And so, so, so I would like to know your definition. Okay, so as we've just done the lead in, you've mentioned the type of clients that you've got. You've got the the geographical setting. You've got some long term ARs. You, you've just taken someone through their PY year, which is to be congratulated. You've you've arranged people. You've got self awareness so that you, that even if a client is referred to one advisor, if another advisor's got a better skill set and a better experience, you're going to do that. So it feels like you've got your front office rules and sort of the way you do things around here down pat um and and you know how are you looking to build for the future which is to your point the engine room and how do you do it sustainably in a quite a limited talent market um in warnable that was one of our biggest hardships at the very start was we put an ad in the paper and you might get one or two and there's no financial planning experience it's not like we're in the city where there's all these financial planning admins and the, looking to grow or jump or not happy with it just didn't happen. So we we went through this stage where we tried a few different people, good people, but just didn't get financial planning. To the to the extent that we then go on, how do we fix this? Which then led us to outsourcing. So without and a shout out to VBP, and we partnered with VBP because that allowed us to bring people into our business, train them, and we could use them to our process, not adapting to a process that sort of that the outsourcing has. There's two types of outsourcing, as I see it. There's one that's got their process, and you tap into it, and then you take their process and you get get a delivery. Or what the way I see VBP and was they became your team member. They're, they're your resource. You train them with the assistance of VBP. They train them. They have their own manager. But effectively, you have your own manager in-house and that's how we really got cut through with our outsourcing. And then from there, we grew the team from one to seven effectively. And so what was the effect of, of just... Being able to get that leverage in a in a quasi rural regional area, you know, you you you're a quasi regional. You're not full regional, but 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 you're definitely not not city, as you said. Um, just getting that ability for your advisors to have uh, support, 
Um, what has that allowed? What, how has that changed the, their um, output and, and their, um, I suppose, focus? So I, I put it to that gave us the foundation of our business. So we got the foundations right, which then gave us the growth trajectory, which allowed knowing that we could see clients and knowing that the advisor could spend time with clients and not do admin, not do applications, not do to the point now that I've got all my advisors literally seeing a client, writing a file note, and the back office handles everything else. And and how do you manage to maintain a culture, um, albeit you are part of the Victorian cohort that got a crash course in working remotely during <laughs> COVID, but how do you how do you now um, perpetuate a culture of um, of, of togetherness and the Welsh Shore way um, from effectively uh, different offices and down the, the Microsoft Teams or Zoom lens? So we have structured meetings and we're big on so we have a structured advisor meeting we have a structured whole team meeting and it's all about bringing the team together. But just because they're on a screen doesn't mean it can't be. And not every one of those meetings is a work meeting. We'll have a just a chat meeting where we get to talk to the VBP guys and know what they're up to. And and they've effectively been part of the team. Just because we're not side by side in the office, they're still part of the team. And I know that they're having little within their own admin groups, they're having team huddles and they're literally we've got team chats going around constantly, which I have to try and work out how to turn off because they just I don't need to see all all the all 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 that they're talking about. I've learned some of the lovely Filipino language, which is and some of the language I probably shouldn't have learned, but that's that's just part of having team members and just because they're not in the office, that's irrelevant to our culture. We're still they're still very much a part of it to the point that we brought our first our first VBP, who her name is Char. She's been with us for over five years now and she's now doing she's now in our office. So she's come to Australia for a, for a month just to be part of to be to be part of the team. So that was really exciting for her. Uh, okay, and so, us. so so quick time out. I'm recording this um in the beginning of June. It might go out in July. Um, how does a balmy uh, eight degrees in Warrnambool um, sort of sit with with those team members? Ah, oh, she's struggling big time. <laughs> it's 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 a little bit cold, but she's got a very very warm snow jacket, and she's got to go up to Queensland where there is some sunshine apparently. But so no, she's she's going <laughs> she's going okay. Oh, awesome, awesome. And look, just jumping into sort of some of the other tools. Um, that that you have, you mentioned before that you're licensed through RI Advice, which which comes with it the the the, the associated technology on on X Plan and whatnot. But is there any other technology um, uh, that that you utilise in your business? Yeah, so so RI Advice have built a tool or bought a tool which was called the Wealth Report, and they've adapted that and used that effectively. It's a front end front end client projected tool. Doesn't really matter what tool. You use, but I can tell you that the projection projection tool changed the way we have client conversations within our office. So when we brought that into the office, it allowed advisors, and all the advisors have said the same thing, you have different conversations, and that allows for what I believe to be better advice. So whether it be Wealth Projector or some other tool that shows projections, and I'm, I'm not wedded to any particular technology I'm big on using the best technology at that time because technology changes so that's part of my mantra and I'll I'll use what I believe is best for my business at that time and then if I need to change it then I will well, look I'm I'm a big fan of uh, the wealth report I, I started actually using that in 2014 long many many years before um it was purchased by by IWF and and um really because uh, I got weary of 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 being you know we had quite sort of robust and emotional and passionate meetings of clients and then that was backed up with pretty pretty dull and and repetitive documentation that you gave them so um that was our main premise so i, I think it, it's a uh, it's good but you're also right these things do change and and it feels like every every other month there's a new piece of technology um which which either is or claiming to sort of solve that 
that that that that goals based advice and that client centric one. So I think we're in good hands in financial services. Um, was there any other pieces of technology? Um, you mentioned you don't you're, you're a pure player financial planning business. Uh, do you, for instance, uh, do you do you use any sort of self managed super funds technology or or, or- so we have partnered with Intello for our self-managed super fund space. So they effectively allow us to plug into their IT system and upload all documents and allow our clients that need that or want that a higher level of self-managed super fund cut through to log into their system. So we have done that. We, we're not a big self-managed super fund a financial planning business. We've got the skill set within the advisor, within a couple of our advisors, to do that. But we've we definitely partner with someone who specialises in that more so where we need to. And what about you? Mentioned you did um, some life insurance. Um, I, I think we wouldn't. Um, uh, it wouldn't wouldn't be it would be remiss of me not to ask how you managed to do that in a profitable way. Um, doing life insurance in twenty twenty three is completely different to when you first started. Um, for for various reasons, um, uh, is there any is there any kind of product providers who who lean into you uh, the most from a service perspective, or 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 is there any um, thing that you think that they can do as a cohort to to improve and and increase engagement on the advisor market? I've had lots of conversations with in and around this. That one of the one of the components is the compliance overlay that sits on insurance advice now. That if you just you're going to need advisors with the the compliance and the technical skills to give advice. That's how you can do it profitably. Because if you if your advisor n- knows how to do it, and we give them the structure, so we give them we give them a really easy, simple structure in our business. That this is how you do insurance, and this is how you can do it profitably. So it's it's effectively a five step process in our business, and we. I don't want to talk too much about advice because this is about the engine room, but the process plugs into our engine room and they t- pick it up. So therefore, the advisor's not doing a lot of grunt work and that's how we can get profit in insurance because obviously commissions have come down, but because the advisor knows the process and that then feeds into the to the admin team, that's how we can get insurance advice out profitably. And and what about investment then? Do you, do you operate an SMA or an MDA or, or do you have particular platforms that you're biased towards? I'm very much biased to SMAs or managed accounts. And I saw the writing on the wall to have a to have profitable and growth orientated business, you can't be running paper models or a different model for every single client because there's it just doesn't fit into a process. So the the big advantage that I see in SMA managed accounts even even multi managers because they're effectively the same thing, um, is that the investment risk is taken away from your business, so that's a tick. Plus, it also gives standardised process for all your back office admin because they know that it's a managed account. Oh well, that's easy. We so when they when they're doing implementation, it takes away implementation risk. So the admin around and the the growth that comes with looking at your business and going. We use a managed account or we use an SMA, which gives us growth structure and the clients love it. The clients actually, when you start speaking to the clients about managed accounts and how they move and transition and and, and we'll adjust to them, they said, oh, we thought that's what you were always doing. But so You, you so, were, but you had to do so much work to make it look like you weren't doing as much work. That's exactly right. And it, can't, and it means that you're up, means that the advice and the review is focused on their goals and objectives and not having to do an ROA and not having to do a switch. Um, and it cuts out all the all the extra work and all the extra processing and typing and implementation that goes with having to do it the old way. And and um, is there is there any um, uh, who do you partner with? Who who, who does um, the platform? And so we've obviously partnered with IWF. Um, model portfolios, but Matt Olson's models have absolutely smashed it out of the park. So shout out to Matt. Um, but effectively that that plugs into multiple platforms. So we we actually have a big, big partnership with Clonial First Aid being not a wrap, it's a master trust and we know that, but the the model 
the MDR is actually on Colonial First Aid. And for our larger clients or the clients that need a more sophisticated type portfolio, we use Hub24 because the MDA is on Hub24. So, And then to that other point, if the client's existing portfolio needs to stay, we'll, we'll, we'll stay there. Well, that's good because that, that gives you that gives you that sort of um that flexibility, and you know you've given me a bit of an idea of of of, of the details of your practice, and and uh, you know you, you self profess you've come through the traditional route. It doesn't get more traditional than your dad was a planner. You started at CBA, you worked in bloody Canberra. I think you're it's almost a satire um, that you've done that. But um um what I would love to know now is uh, you've grown um as you as you've mentioned quite rapidly in a in a in a in a in a regional area. Um I would like to know um why people join you um outside of going to high school with you because you'll run out of those pretty soon. Um why people um stay and and why are they growing? You know what's your culture all about, Brett? That's a really good lead in there, Roxy. And I probably. I'll talk to uh, Steve and Steve Greenham. He's recently joined our practice. He's in Portland, so we now have an office in Portland. But he was the traditional AMP advisor. He was licensed to AMP, and then he ended up at FSP. But he was a two advisor practice, fully AMP. And I got to know Steve. And he's been and- around. He's he's been going since 1992. His profile says. He has, so he's 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 done his time. So, but what what has happened is Steve is a great is a great planner, but he just needed advisor and structure around him. So he he was sort of dis, he was one of these advisors that probably and Steve won't mind me saying this. He got a little bit disenchanted with advice, and he he was at when we started chatting. It was all about him retiring and getting out of the network and getting out of advice and. Within 12 months, probably only took about four or five, to be honest, um, we put we put our process around him. We, we, he started coming to advisor meetings. We started having joint advice, advisor appointments. We bounced ideas off each other. And he's, he's, he's fully now invested and loves, loves the process, loves the fact that he, all he has to do is see the client, give it to our back office, and he he he's he's our, he's the biggest problem is just keeping him under control or or he'll see see too many clients and um to the point that we have to bring on more people to just accommodate but that plugs into our process so it's actually okay but but your your engine room has effectively you know uh, given the backdrop of the statistics of so many advisors leaving and we've there's a, there's a number. Um, I was listening uh, to um, Core Data's number the other day. I think we're at fifteen thousand advisors. Steve had a good chance of being one of those statistics, of of just 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 leaving, but by actually creating that environment, um, and and having having the I suppose the flexibility of having him in his hometown as well, um, you've you've not only uh, it's like basketball. You've you've defended the basket, but you've already you've, you've then you've then attacked and got a few points. So um, well well done, and and it's. Uh, uh, you know, the whole point of promoting um, the business of the business is that there are many advisors that 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 I think have been maligned um, and a bit older advisors. Um, and I think that if you do wrap a support network around them, you're going to get nuggets of gold everywhere you look with these people. Would you agree with that? Very much so. Look, sometimes it's just about having conversations and and re-engaging and reigniting that passion that it that was financial advice. There's, yes, it's changed a little bit, but the advice is still talking to a client, finding out what they want, and giving them a solution, and then getting the client to trust you. You don't lose that ability, I don't believe. It's just how do we re-engage? How do we reinvigorate? And on my whole ethos when I started this build process was. I want good people and I want them to be happy and have fun at work. So my staff are my biggest asset and we spend a lot of time working out what they need, what what they want and and within business structure, of course, and process, but they, the staff are my most important people. And I was just going to say, um, when you say you want to get good people, um, do you have a structured recruitment process to get good people or you just figure you're a good person and I'll hang out with you? What's what's the 
what's the Welsh your way of, 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 of bringing people into the business? The first part is having a chat, getting to know whether we're going to be, it's a bit like bringing on a new client is how I see it. We get to know each other. We we have start having conversations, and then then it is structured in that we have there'll be a few interviews, and there'll be um, we also like to do a a disc profile or yep or just to get to know how they they like to um, and how they will fit into our team because and, obviously and, and, and given given Steve came in as a as a as a frontline AR in relation to the disc profile, I mean, a lot of people listening would have done one of those in their career. What, what are you looking for in particular? And is it the normal stereotype or is it something else? I, I'm not looking for anything particularly on that disc profile. What I want to know is what is the disc profile so that I then know how that would then fit into my team. Perfect. And then also allow my team to adjust and and understand that this person's going to prefer an email, this person's going to prefer to, and this person's not going to give you all the information because they operate over here. So you're going to have to remind them. So it's all about learning and, and adjusting so that we get the right outcomes. Probably also give you early doors insights into the type of clients that, that work for these uh, for these advisors as well. So no, well played. Um, and the second one is um, you like people to good people having happy and fun time at work. Um how do you reward your team and how do you have fun? What's 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 fun and reward look like at Wellshore? So we, we're big on this, but um there's a there's a couple of set reward stuff that we always do every year in it and one is end of fun for year and one is the Christmas party and they're well renowned. But we'll also do uh, ad hoc we we very much enjoy birthdays. So birthdays are very well celebrated in our office and that that is that becomes morning tea and uh, that is a celebration itself and, and good work where we where we can see that people have had a lot of where our load has been very very high will be rewarded with a especially for the ladies they like that we've got a lovely deep deep blue shout out to a local Warrnambool deep blue spa we'll send them down there for a relaxing afternoon and give them the day, half a day off just to to go yep yeah, we really do enjoy. We can see that you've worked hard. Here's a break. So we do that as well every now and then. That's that's that that's ad hoc depending on workload, but we very much do that. And so when you're when you're um sitting in down down and doing your strategy, um and you've got your engine room involved, you've got your customer service people, your power planning, you've got your global team onshore, offshore. Um, do you do you set these down on quarters or or six monthly? And 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 is there like a team goal that you you, you set and um. Uh, or how do you how do you convey the, the the overall corporate direction as as the leader and the of the business? So that's been a recent shift in our business to make sure that we keep continued growth. But it is now that we have now sat down with all the team and and we're doing it six monthly and just aligning to to what our effectively our EBIT. We, we've told them what our end goal on EBIT is, not the actual total number because I, I I don't want a total number I want profitable business and growing so they're fully aware and understand um, some of the financials within our business and obviously they're sat down every six months with a formal process with my business manager to check in on what their growth looks like what their performance looks like what, what what's their direction so that we're all growing as a team I don't want some people just want to do their job and be be whatever, but we're very much if they want to grow and they want to become advisors, as proven with Kate bringing Kate through the PY, um, or they want to become para planners, or they want to become office managers. That's that is a structured process, and we do that. So, so from my my personal history and my observed history um, in talking to a lot of planners, getting that accountability um, from uh, a, a, across all parts of the business. Um, uh, with people and making them feel like that if they've personally achieved, they've moved the dial and the business is, is critical. Is that what you mean by sitting down every six months? There's, yeah. there's And that, that's with everyone. That's with your your, your, your back office, yeah. your engine room, the whole thing. And and, and um, do you feel that since you've been doing that, that, that people uh, who potentially are behind the scenes um, feel a bit more rewarded? Yeah, very much so. And Part of that was to also probably transition and 
we're, we're in the process of establishing an ESOP so that that rewards everyone who wants to and who we give access to will, will then have ownership in the business. So that was part of it. It was a transition to then can sustain growth and have buy in. So well, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of businesses and the fact that you're, you've got rhythm cadence, you're getting the right people doing the right things, you, you, you're disclosing financials, creating accountability, and now you're offering up a share in the, in the game is, is, is the cornerstone um, for, for growing a business. And a bit later, I'm going to talk about your vision for the future and your growth plans. But from what you've mentioned there, um, you are looking at doing that. I just had a, a, another question. Um, financial planning is a very rewarding business and, and we associate a lot with making people money. But does do, do you or the Wealth Shore have a, a charitable program or a giving um, kind of program? If so, how, do, how, how does it happen and, and how do your team members get um, sort of invested in that? I've always been big on giving back to the community. I've got two specific charities that I, I probably have a focus on. Um, one, one is what is a local charity. It's Peter's Project and they raise money to build a cancer center. So they've got a world class, we've got a world class cancer center for cancer support here in Warrnambool so that the cancer, people who have cancer didn't have to go to Geelong or, or Melbourne. So, so I, I give them free advice that that charity is going, went on leaps and bounds. They raised more money than they needed to build a multi million dollar building. So that, that's close to my heart. And that, that also feeds into pro bono work with Cancer Council. But the other charity that's pretty close to my heart is um, MS. So obviously MS is Australia wide, but where there is a local Warnable MS support group and I'm very much help them out and passionate about that. And and what why is there any was there any sort of triggers as to, to why you uh, picked those charities? My, my, my wife has MS, so oh, there's a go. there's a background story there. But yep. she that's that's why I'm very very passionate about that one. So and she's obviously there to support other people in the town. But she went through that. She was supported, and now she's one of the ones giving the support. But a big part of that is making sure that we. Um, I just see that that's. As financial planners, we're very, very lucky. So where we can give back, and that's probably something we all should do as financial planners, and I think we do. The problem is we just don't – no one hears about it. I think you're, I think you're completely correct. Um, uh, the, the giving um, – uh, the, 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 I suppose the, uh, the perception of financial planners is not the reality. The perception is, um, you know, the, the Wall Street-style person. The reality is local people – Working in communities, helping families solve their financial problems, giving back exactly how you've done. You've just mentioned two things that are that you are very, very are local and, and obviously a, a heartfelt um, sort of story in relation to your own family and your wife in particular. So, um, you know, thank you, thank you very much for sharing. And and I think that people who uh, are making a, a choice as to where they want to spend the majority of their week, which is also called employment. Uh, are drawn towards people with purpose, compassion, and empathy, as well as that business knowledge. So um, uh, it, it's clear that that you're really focusing on that that southwest Victoria. Now, in saying that, you've grown your business from X to Y. So the growth story. When did it start? Like when did it accelerate? Um, in reality, and 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 that's the first part of the question. And what's your vision? What's your vision for Wellshore? And also, what's your vision for? As I pointed out, the engine rooms, or, or I know you've got a you've got someone involved in in, in operations and practice, but where do you see uh, the, the 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 composition of of financial services firms in the future? Growth profile started in two thousand and sixteen, and that probably was when the transition arrangement with Steve Hickman, and we ended up with what we did, and that was a rough base of I think it was around about eight hundred thousand, and then we've managed to grow that to nearly two and a half turnover. So that, that's that been the growth profile since 2016. It's been on an upward trend and it, it's continuing. Um, we've got the processes now, back office. So as we get more clients or we get another advisor, we just can plug more people into that engine room or, or back office admin so that we've got our processes so that they all just tap in and 
it continues on its merry way as we need to. We so and that may be offshore and it may be onshore, depending on what the needs of the business are at that time. But they all we all tap into the same process. So that's that's really important. And do you have an opinion? So you mentioned you you you've, you've, you've now moved the uh, I suppose the awareness towards an EBITDA um, percentage, um, not not number. Yep. Um, you, you 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 are a growth business, so um, there's probably some reinvestment into the now for build the capacity cup. But what would you say would be an aspirational um, uh, EBIT number once you do get to your, a maturity state, as far as percentage? Sorry, percentage. Yeah, percentage. So I I, I want it above thirty five. So and I was obviously it's sitting not quite there yet, but it's it's getting closer. And if we can have it at 35 and continue to grow the the obviously the revenue and keep the expenses in line, then obviously then we end up with a with an amazing business. And also um no point having an ESOP if uh, you're doing an ESOP into a business that doesn't make any money. Um, <laughs> that's called just getting a raise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's capital raising as opposed to that. So um so obviously that's where that's where the business is going, and look, we're looking to get good people who are on the same journey, people who want to plug in. Anyone in any anyone who wants to see change or come down or wants to be in the southwest and want to reach out, more than happy to have a chat. So and and also, um, you, your your office is in in Warrnambool, but you've got a one in Portland. Your your take on where the uh, the future team members in your area uh, are operating from is flexible, or is it, or have you got a, a particular vision on that? Yeah, very much so. Um, because of the, the changes that we that what we well got to, got to love Dan Andrews or, or not, uh, we we got locked down. So my power planner is actually in Queensland. So my advisors we've got Zoom. We've got teams where they can be anywhere they like and fully flexible in the sense as provided they're seeing their clients and doing their job, then they can tap in. They could be overseas. And just, just I'm throwing a thought bubble out here, just reiterating that would also um, indicate that you've got no problems having clients in Melbourne as a, as a, or Geelong, as, as you've intimated. So um, I think uh, your, your, your pitch just then was uh, if you're an advisor in the area and you like the idea of the end room, but also if you're an advisor who just likes to come down and, and, and smell the sweet uh, sea air, at, um, you're, you're open to those kind of approaches. Would that be fair, Brett? Very much so, sir. And what about growing inorganically um, through through a merger or acquisition? Is that ever uh, – you have, you've yet to do that, but has that ever no, sort no, of no, been no, an idea? That, the actual last one was a merger okay, in the sense that it's with, say, so Steve – Steve came in as a merger, so that was a merger of the practice. So we we can do it that way as well, uh, and it really just depend does depend on the people and the and what's going to work. Because I'm big on win win. So if it's not going to fit, then that's okay. But where we're aligned, we can work out the best way. And if that's an acquisition, if that's a a merger, then then that will be a discussion point and we'll come up with the what's best for everyone. And that, that's that's how you succeed in business because that's my view in that if you're making things better for everyone, then you get a better result and then people buy in and the the end, the end result is the clients are better off because you've got happy staff, you've got a good result for the clients. So that's how I, that's how I have tried to do everything I, while I've been on this projector. And I think you've just very clearly articulated the whole business premise for Ensemble. You know, it started with the, creating the positive evolution of financial advisors or advice. Um, it's it's nailing the brief of advisors. And what 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 Ensemble wants to promote now is that it's a home for everyone in, in the advice ecosystem, whether you be a power planner or a financial planning administration person, it's still good to have peers and it's still good to ask questions um, and get answers from people who are in to going through the same things, and they might be in Darwin or or Perth or Warrnambool, um, but it gives that that real real community spirit. and And without without creating uh, great environments, um, we'd be back at the beginning of this podcast with you servicing one you being one person and not really being able to service people too well to where you are now, where you proudly mentioned that 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 you kind of dominate the aged care uh, sort of market, which also 
is, is a really big community service because for every person going into aged care, there's there, there, there's worried children, um, adult children who, who 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 may or may not be under financial stress. They don't know what to do. There's estate planning, professional estate planning requirements as well. So so everything has a positive sort of flow on if you manage to build a good quality company. Um, and do you have any sort of sort of visions for the future of financial planning, so to speak? I think the future of financial planning is going to be very dependent on legislative changes, probably. But my the future of financial advice in Welshore is making is we've been very big on what the clients need, client making the clients better. So we've very much streamlined our process and using technology to bring the clients along. So we're so in that sense, the future is probably digitally enhanced by the advisor and client relationship to give the client better outcomes. That's probably where I see advice. What what that ends up being will depend on legislation and what we're allowed to do, but it's very much open to the to the business to to determine how they best deliver advice to the client. I think your passion and your down to earth nature is part of the reason why Wealthshore is succeeding. I I also note that your your turnover of people in your business is is very low. So once once people um do do get into your environment, um, they do stay. And, and look, I've really enjoyed um, uh, the Engine Room podcast. I've, I also enjoy our social time. You can be quite a, a fun person to hang around. And if anyone would like any more information, it'll all be in the attached links. And without any further ado, thank you very much for being on the Engine Room pad. Have a great day. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Roxy. Really appreciated the time and the chat, mate. Hopefully, people got something out of it. Cheers. Take care.